Audio of Unit 7, Contemporary West, Reactions to Industrialism, Romanticism, New Science, Realism, and Mass Society. We're going to start with Romanticism, New Science, and Realism. First, we start with Romanticism. In the arts, Romanticism stressed individualism and emotion instead of the Enlightenment's focus on universalism and reason. The Romantic movement is an artistic and um, intellectual movement that basically is a reaction against the age of reason. It's a reaction against too much science and the idea that too much science had created ugliness in society with the Industrial Revolution and the problems that came along with it. At the end of the 18th century, this new intellectual movement known as Romanticism emerged. Now, Romanticism primarily emphasized feeling and emotion, and it valued individualism still, even though it did not like this, the age of reason um, focusing too much on reason and too much on science. It still believed in individualism. Romantic artists uh, that were painters painted as a reflection of the artist's inner feelings and infused warmth and emotion into their paintings. The Romanticism goes beyond just the visual arts. It also is incorporated into music. Probably the most famous of all of the Romantic composers is Ludwig van Beethoven, who wrote music with powerful melodies that created dramatic intensity. If you would like to hear a sample, you can hear Ode to Joy from his Ninth Symphony by clicking on that link. When, it, when you listen to it, pay attention to how it emits emotion, how the uh, melody drives the, uh, the music, as well as how you hear the building of emotion as you move through the movement. Uh, it's, very, it's a very emotional piece and uh, oftentimes played in uh, churches uh, at Easter time as well as uh, you know, at Christmas to celebrate um, the power of God, the power of the Lord. Um, and so you can see the emotion or feel the emotion build as you listen through the entire movement. Literature also um, was part of the Romantic movement and it reflected a Romantic interest in the past. Now, if any of you have ever heard the phrase before, looking at the past through rose-colored glasses, that is basically what the Romantic period did. It saw the Industrial Revolution with, of course, being an offshoot of the Age of Reason and the Scientific Revolution. Uh, it saw it as ugly and having brought about more misery in society. Not only that, it also saw it as physically marring the landscape by filling the skies with with um, smoke uh, from the coal, from the steam engines, etc. So they saw it as dirty and ugly. So they were looking back to what they saw as a simpler time, looking back to medieval subjects. Writers chose medieval subjects. They invoked strong feelings of nationalism oftentimes. But as we know, the medieval period was not all that terrific. So that's what we mean by looking at the past through rose-colored glasses, seeing it as better than it actually was. Probably the most famous um, part of literature that comes out of the Romantic period is the invention of Gothic literature. Two of the most famous Gothic um, writers were Mary Shelley and Edgar Allan Poe. Mary Shelley was the author of Frankenstein, and it's one of the most famous of all Gothic novels. As a matter of fact, she is often given credit for inventing the genre of the Gothic novel. Um, if you think about, you know, even if you've never read the novel, you will in senior year if you go to Providence, um, you probably know the basics of the story. Dr. Frankenstein, uh, who was a believer in science and a believer in reason, et cetera, et cetera, and the power of science, uh, decides to play God, thinks that he can recreate life or reanimate life into a dead body does experiments on this and eventually creates a monster that ends up destroying him. Now, Mary Shelley was, um, was the daughter of another famous woman that we have discussed in this class. 
Uh, her mother was Mary Wollstonecraft, who was one of the earliest feminists who, back in the late 1700s in England, um, had written a work called The Vindication of the Rights of Women. And it will ultimately become kind of the Bible for the uh, the women's rights movement and the women's suffragette movement, which we're going to discuss more later on in this lecture. Um, her daughter married a very famous poet who is not another romantic poet. His name was Percy Shelley. That's why her name is Mary Shelley. Uh, they were great friends with another important romantic poet, Lord Byron. And there was uh, an incident where they, the three of them, including others, uh, were all uh, celebrating a party together and they decided that they would have a competition on who could create the scariest story. Uh, Mary Shelley came up with the concept of uh, Frankenstein and won the contest and created a new genre, if you will, the Gothic novel. Now, poetry, like I mentioned, Lord Byron and Percy Shelley, poetry was seen by many as the ideal form of expression for the romantics. Uh, love of nature was a popular topic in many of the poems. Um, also, uh, like I said, looking back to the past, uh, the medieval past, looking back with rose-colored glasses, seeing it as better than it actually was. But we uh, do see it also emphasizing emotion and not so much stressing reason and science. Now we also see another movement in contrast to romanticism called realism. Now this is another artistic and intellectual movement. Um, artistic uh, realist artists and we're just that. They tried to portray things as they realistically saw them rather than things that might have been from the imagination or emotions like the Romantics did. So the rise of the new science with the second Industrial Revolution, which we'll discuss in a bit, encouraged writers and artists to create realistic works. Um, this is more so as we get to the end of the 19th century whereas the Romantic artists were more in the middle of the 19th century. So it's like the next generation of artists were uh, doing, you know, the opposite. Like I talked about before, the pendulum swinging back and forth between different movements. Anyhow, they wanted to portray even the poor and the degraded in society in a realistic way to try to draw attention to the problems of society so therefore people might be more inclined to make political changes or what have you to fix the problems of society. So in both literary and visual arts, realism became a movement driven by the ability to represent the world realistically. And if you think about it, it is a natural offshoot to the political ideal of realpolitik that we discussed in the last unit. Uh, literary realists of the period rejected the ideals of romanticism and wrote instead about ordinary characters rather than fanciful ones or, uh, you know, monsters and uh, uh, supernatural creatures, ordinary characters, ordinary brands of life. Uh, Charles Dickens is probably one of the most famous of the realist writers. He showed the realities of life in industrial London for the poor and unpri unprivileged classes in his novels, like Oliver Twist and David Copperfield. These characters were so sympathetic that they helped inspire social reform, and it shows the downside of the industrial age. Many people were so drawn to his characters and the plight that they suffered as, uh, you know, at the hands of, you know, the industrial society that many were starting to push for the government to make changes to make life better for the working class poor. This uh, is only really possible um, in a place like England where he lived that already had adopted a lot of evolutionary liberalism in their government, addressing the needs of reform as they came about. After about 1850, realism in art became the dominant style, like I said, replacing the romantics. Uh, the last half of the 19th century. The French artist Gustave Courbet, that you see uh, one of his works here on the right, um, painted scenes from everyday life that included peasants and factory workers. 
this one here is called the rock breakers. They're just regular peasant people who do manual labor on a daily basis. Does not show them, you know, uh, clean and everything. Shows them as they are. If you work with your hands, you get money, and sometimes it's not a pretty thing. Now, we do also simultaneously with Romanticism have as a counterpoint another new age of science emerging. Now, uh, as you can see, Romanticism and new science are running counter to each other. They are against each other. They are forces that are in uh, contrast to each other, if you will. Um, and so that would be an interesting way to think, to think about, you know, the uh, intellectual concepts from this unit, these different um, movements running counter to each other. It could be a good essay question or something. Anyhow, the new age of science, we see rapid advances in science happening as we enter the later half of the 19th century. And the second industrial revolution will be another byproduct of this. Um, rapid advances in science and technology fueled new industrial growth, made medical care more effective, and challenged religious faith ultimately in many cases. So we're going to start by looking at these new discoveries in science. Many of them led to a growing faith in science, which in turn undermined religious faith in the minds of many people. Uh, scientists such as Louis Pasteur and Dmitry Mendeleev made advancements in medicine and in chemistry. As we know, Louis Pasteur discovered that microbes were responsible for souring alcohol and came up with the process of pasteurization where bacteria is destroyed by heating beverages and then allowing them to cool. He did this with milk starting off. Uh, his work will eventually give way to what is known as germ theory, and it also led him and his team to create vaccinations for things like anthrax and rabies. For many people in the 19th century, the truth gleaned from science led to an increasing secularization of society more dependence on science and less dependence on religious faith. Interestingly enough, even though a lot of the romantics seem to be kind of bohemian and thinking outside the box and stressing emotion, oftentimes they experimented with, um, with drugs and alcohol like uh, in ways that they probably shouldn't have, but they did like the idea of religious devotion because it evoked emotion. So they would be anti-new science and anti-secularizing society because they would see it as um, being too um, um, scientific and not enough emotion. We are probably one of the most famous or infamous uh, scientists from this period uh, is, is really known more as a, um, um, a biologist. In 1859, man by the name of Charles Darwin wrote his book called On the Origins of Species by Means of Natural Selection. This book was based on the idea that all species evolved according to a principle known as organic evolution. Darwin explained that some species in the world were more adaptable to their environment than others, and those that were more adaptable through a process called natural selection, were ultimately the most fit of those species, and they would outlive those that were not as fit. They developed genetic variants that allowed them to survive, whereas other um, members of the species that did not have those genetic variants would die out. Um, I usually like to use the example of a giraffe. You know, when you think of a giraffe, you think of the long neck. Well, if you look back at fossil evidence of giraffes, you will see that they did not always have as long a neck as they have now. It seems as, uh, you know, their food store source grew, which was trees, as they, the food source grew taller, those giraffes that had the longer necks were able to feed themselves, and those that did not were not, and they died off and were not there to pass on those genetic traits to their young like the ones with the longer necks were. So therefore, natural nature selected the ones with the longer necks to survive instead of those with the shorter necks. Darwin's inclusion of humans in his theory, however, 
was very controversial, and it still is to this day. Although most scientists and intellectuals gradually came to accept parts of his theory, there are still parts today that some scientists as, as well as others have problems with. And so take that as you will. Um, if you look at the quote here from Charles Darwin, he says, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change. All right, so first, let's talk about how the second industrial revolution contributes to this mass society, okay? But in Western Europe, the introduction of electricity, chemicals, and petroleum triggered the second industrial revolution and a world economy began to develop, okay? So if we look at the first industrial revolution that we covered in the last unit, it began in the middle of the 18th century in England at least, and then spread to the continent by the beginning of the 19th century, okay, the, through the first half of the 19th century. We know that steam power was primary there. Steam power um, was, was dominant in most every industry. In the second industrial revolution, the power will be uh, electricity, chemicals, and petroleum. And we will see the development of a combustible engine rather than a steam-powered engine, okay? So in the second industrial revolution, there was greater use of steel, chemicals, petroleum, and electricity, as I said. Electricity was a new form of energy that gave way to many new inventions, as we know. And this really came about because of in the United States, a man named Thomas Edison ultimately was able to harness this electricity and create the light bulb. And, um, and homes and businesses and factories would be able to use this affordable resource for convenience and productivity as a result of that. Marconi and others will also utilize electricity in their inventions as we will see moving through the remaining slides. Alexander Graham Bell was another important inventor of the second industrial revolution. He invented the telephone and um, this will help communications increase. Um, another advocate in communication would be the radio pioneer, uh, Guglielmo Marconi, and he sparked a revolution in communications. Eventually, this will make it so communications can be done from city to city, not just within a city, um, and eventually even across the ocean. The internal combustion engine, however, is probably the most important of all of the inventions of the second industrial revolution. It revolutionized transportation with the automobile, while the airplane eventually also makes its appearance as well using the same engine, the internal combustion engine. Now, with the Second Industrial Revolution, prices for produced goods decreased as a result of lower production and transportation costs. In other words, efficiency will eventually lead to lower prices and more consumerism. One of the things that allowed for this was the creation of the assembly line. This allowed for more efficient mass production of goods. And the man responsible for the beginning of this is, of course, the United States own Henry Ford. Eventually, it will spread to Europe as well. In Europe, nations in the North and West had a higher standard of living for their citizens as they started to adopt the assembly line process. Now remember, this is all about, instead of one worker creating the entirety of one product, they worked on one small part of that product and it moved down the line to be worked on by somebody else that would attach the next piece and move on to down the line to the next worker that would attach the next piece. And this way, products could be made more quickly and more efficiently and more specialized um, um, working of each of those um, workers. This ultimately will uh, cause a mass, um, I guess, explosion of goods in the marketplace which will uh, lead to even more consumerism. Now, as I said, in the North and in the Western parts of Europe, a higher standard of living for, their, for citizens developed because they became more and more reliant on this new mode of production. While the Southeastern regions of Europe remain largely agricultural and rural with lower standards of living, especially if one looks at Russia, 
as well as the Balkans region. Now, Russia, as we know, is still behind when it comes to industrial uh, production, and they will remain behind even as we approach the beginning of the 20th century and World War I. By 1900, however, over most of Europe, as well as the United States, there was a true world economy that was occurring. Europe dominated this global economy by, by the beginning of the 20th century, but the United States will be quickly uh, on their heels as we move into um, the 20th century, especially beyond World War I. Now let's start talking a little bit more about what happens uh, in politics as well as in economics as we move deeper into the 19th century. This is a period that is oftentimes referred to as the period of mass society and increased democracy. When we talk about democracy with this, what we really mean is giving more people the ability to participate in their government through voting. Okay, so democracy, people receiving the vote or giving them suffrage, giving them the vote. As more and more nations start to incorporate more and more people into the voting, as more and more nations build constitutional governments and create national legislatures, they eventually continue to lower the property qualifications for voting for those legislatures, eventually moving towards universal male suffrage. As that voting group increases in size, as it approaches, um, you know, universal male suffrage, not women yet, but we'll talk about that more at the end of this lecture. We're going to see that many more socialist reforms will be put into governmental practice. This is one of the reasons why it is during this era of mass society, the last half of the 19th century, that we start to move away from the more classical definitions of, quote, liberalism and, quote, conservatism to the more um, modern day definitions of liberalism and conservatism. As I mentioned in the last unit, modern day liberalism and conservatism both have elements of socialism in them. There is no um, one party that does not believe that there shouldn't be some kind of safety nets for some people. They just differ on how much of a safety net should be provided by the government. And that is why we have the increase of what is known as mass society as we approach more universal male suffrage in these different nations. It does not happen in the same rate in all of the nations of Europe, however. Now, as we mentioned before, we have uh, some changes that will also happen in the workforce as well as in social classes as a result of all of these developments in industrial society. This continues into the second industrial revolution as well. Industrialization gave some a higher standard of living, but struggling workers turned to trade unions or socialism to try to improve their lives. Eventually, this will give way to some political parties adopting some social principles into their platforms to attract the votes of those people of the lower classes as they are given the vote. If your party wants to stay in power, they have to attract the new voters that are being given the vote, and the new voters want social reforms, okay, especially as those voters are the working class. And this, of course, does not happen overnight or at the same pace everywhere, but by the end of the 19th century, most of Europe uh, had adopted universal male suffrage and constitutional governments. Most, not all. Not Russia, of course, not some of southeastern Europe. The transition to an industrialized society was hard on the workers, as we've discussed in the last unit. They often worked dangerous jobs for very poor wages, and they lived in crowded slums. Most of this had to do with the laissez-faire economic policies that many of those governments had adopted. We already talked about that there were some reformers of the capitalist society who wanted a better environment for the working class. Uh, more radical reformers wanted to abolish capitalism altogether in favor of what would be called socialism. Many socialists were based on the theory of the German Karl Marx. Now, we discussed utopian socialists more in the last unit, uh, 
but uh, we know that uh, Marx considered their ideas too idealistic. And he saw his as being based more on scientific reasoning. So we are going to try to explain his policies um, in a nutshell as best we can. And if you have any questions, if you are listening to this lecture and have any questions, you can ask me directly in class as well. Okay, so as I said, many socialist ideas were based on the theory of the German Karl Marx, who was a scientific socialist. Remember, he and other later socialists like him felt that their ideas about socialism were based more in reality and based on science and history, rather than the earlier socialists whom they called utopian socialists, thinking their ideas were too, well, idealistic. Karl Marx and his partner um, in writing, who was Frederick Engels, wrote a book called The Communist Manifesto and published it in 1848. In this book, they outlined their beliefs that industrial capitalism was to blame for the problems that were besetting society. In particular, they believed that capitalism bore the seeds of its own destruction because capitalism because of the Industrial Revolution, created two new classes that were fighting against each other. Now, Marx and Engels had said that all history is pushed by class struggle, and that now that the Industrial Age has occurred, this will be the final stage of the class struggle before an all-out class rebellion takes place, ending all classes and ultimately ending all class struggle. The Industrial Revolution had created the two new classes, and you see them listed here. Marx believed that the proletariat, which are the working class, would violently overthrow the bourgeoisie or the capitalist factory owners. And they would ultimately, by doing so, destroy the idea of ownership of property. Instead, the factories themselves and the means of production, the, the machines, etc., everything would be owned communally by all of society. Once the ownership of private property was destroyed, Marx argued that the, all classes ultimately disappear because haves and have-nots, upper classes and lower classes, the um, ownership of property, of stuff, if you will, is what kept the classes separate. So if you eliminate the ownership of property, you eliminate classes altogether. And he also argued that that would um, ultimately establish what would be known as dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, this was not the dictatorship of a single person, but instead of the proletariat in general. But what's important to recognize is that after overthrowing the bourgeoisie, ultimately that means that all of those who had been in the bourgeoisie would now be part of the proletariat. In other words, there would not be any classes. Everyone would be the same in the proletariat category, I guess you would say, thus establishing a classless society. And once there was no longer classes, then all of the institutions that have been created throughout history to keep the classes separate, which included governing structures, the state itself, the creation of nations, even religious ideology, Marx argued, all of that would disappear as well. Now, if you, as you see down here at the bottom, what would be the cause of this ultimate, you know, inevitable revolution? because Marx did argue that this would inevitably happen, happen, that the proletariat would rise up. It was because of what he called the labor theory of value. And ultimately, that is because Marx and Engels argued that all things um, that have value have value because a worker put work into it. In other words, until a worker puts work into something, it does not have value. So let's take, for example, a wooden desk. Prior to it being made into a desk by a worker, labor being applied to the actual wood 
Marx and Engels would argue that the wood in and of itself did not have value. It only had potential to have value. It was the worker that applied labor to the wood and created the desk that gave it value. Therefore, if uh, the, the bourgeoisie takes that, um, takes that product, takes that desk and sells it in the marketplace and gains a profit by only giving a small percentage of the surplus value back to the worker in the form of his wage. This is what Marx said what was why capitalism in and of itself was based on theft. This labor theory of value, this exploitation of the proletariat, the stealing of the surplus value that was given to a product by the laborer or by the proletariat would finally be the reason that the communist revolution would take place. And as you see here, one of his most famous um, quotes from Communist Manifesto was, quote, let the ruling classes tremble at a communist revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries unite. Now we will discuss more about the impact of Marx moving forward, but it's important to note that every um, so-called communist revolution that has happened in the world up to this point has only happened partially in the direction that Marx said it would go. In other words, a quote, true communist revolution based on the principles of Marx, based on what Marx said would happen, has never truly happened. And that is part of why some people argue um, Marx's ideas are irrelevant. But it's important for us as historians also to recognize that because of the what many viewed as the threat of socialism, if changes were not made to the existing order of society, um, if working class men were not given some kind of social reforms, um, you know, if the government did not respond to the call for some kind of regulation um, instead of having full-fledged laissez-faire economics, that there would be this revolution. So it could be argued that political parties start to morph and change as more and more people get the vote to become more socialistic. In other words, every party becomes a little bit socialistic, just not full-fledged and not to the same amounts because they wanted to keep this threat of a communist revolution from happening. We'll discuss this more as we move through this, the rest of this lecture. Now, in many European nations, working class leaders formed socialist parties based on Marx's ideas, but they were divided on their goals. Again, this shows you that Marx's ideas that he had in the Communist Manifesto were never fully adhered to. They might have adhered to some of his ideas, but not all of them. Okay, so here's the difference. Pure Marxists, like Marx himself, wanted revolution to happen, to defeat capitalism, to destroy capitalism, and to destroy the ownership of private property. While revisionist Marxists, okay, argued that political gains were the key to change, okay? So revisionist Marxists were saying that instead of through revolution, that the real change could be made to the plight of the poor working class through politics. And this is what their, their goal was, to change the way um, the other political parties maneuver in order to have them incorporate socialist reforms into their agendas. Now, we will also talk more about revisionists as we move forward in um, other units. And we'll talk more about this later, in particular with Lenin in um, the communist revolution that happens in Russia um, in the early 1900s. Now, to improve their conditions, workers will start to organize into unions. And by organizing into unions, they, um, they do so to try to demand better working conditions and they use strikes as their bargaining tool. And this ultimately works better for them than revolution. Now this happens slowly because not um, all nations allow for unions to organize right away. 
Um, uh, but it, eventually, by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, most all of the Western European nations, as well as the United States, allowed for unions to be formed so the workers could bargain collectively to get better, um, better goals and better reforms for them guaranteed by the, the owners of the factories. Now we also need to discuss the new urban environment that comes about as a result of increased industrialization with the second industrial revolution. As workers migrated to cities, as we've discussed ha happened since the beginning of the industrial revolution, local governments had to solve urgent public health problems. And again, this goes um, against true laissez-faire economics. The solutions ultimately, however, were necessary to allow cities to grow even more. So as people moved into cities in search of economic opportunities, jobs, European society became more urban. For example, Manchester, England, is known as Shock City because it grew so quickly, almost overnight, due to the cotton textile industry that the um, city planners could not keep up with the demands for housing and for public sanitation uh, and for, you know, a police force. And ultimately, they um, had to do a lot of backtracking to fix the problems that were created there. Reformers, however, were able to urge local governments to try to improve conditions in the cities, although it would be a slow, slow process from the get-go. But ultimately, there will be some improvements made, sponsored by local governments, and then eventually national governments moving forward. Improved housing, improved water condition, and sewage systems led to a safer living environment. Now again, this would mean government regulation of certain industries, including um, you know, uh, building housing and building factories and building the sewage systems and those kinds of things. So this of course goes against complete laissez-faire economics, but it was a response to the needs that were that manifested themselves due to the Industrial Revolution. And again, this is why we say that more social reforms would be enacted into governments as more and more of the lower classes, eventually the workers, get the vote in these constitutional governments. Improved living conditions will enable people to live in close quarters without getting sick because they have better living conditions. And cities such as London and Frankfurt were able to accommodate larger populations. This is why they start building tenement structures that, that build up rather than out. Okay, and eventually we'll have things like skyscrapers um, in many industrial centers. Now the social structure. Uh, European society was comprised of three broad social classes from the get-go, upper, middle, and lower, if you will. And now we see those upper, middle, and lower classes are a little bit different than they had been prior to the industrial age. Okay, first of all, the elite class, which used to be the nobility, was now made up of wealthy bankers, industrialists or factory owners, and merchants. This minority became leaders in the government and in the military. They became leaders in the legislate, legislatures, um, like the British Parliament. They were the ones that were elected to the House of Commons um, by others just like them. So the elite class now is no longer really the traditional nobility. Instead, it is the capitalists, it is those bourgeoisie who have become the main business owners due to the industrial age. Okay, they have moved up from what from where they had been the middle class before. Now they are the elite class. There are still traditional nobles around, but they don't really have the influence that they once had. And therefore, we don't really consider them the elite class anymore. Now below the, um, the bourgeoisie, if you will, um, are the traditional middle class that we have like today. Okay, there are several groups, however, in this middle class. First of all, there is a lower middle class that consisted of small shopkeepers, traders, and prosperous farmers. These would be like today, the small businessmen. 
Okay, they they can't compete with the big businessmen, um, you know, the big businessmen uh, with the big companies, the big banks and big companies um, like the Ford Motor Company, if you will. But they are small businessmen that own their own businesses. Still, okay, below them. Um, in the middle part of the middle class would be the white collar workers, okay, including traveling salespeople at the time, bookkeepers, secretaries, um, and um, these, again, were between the lower middle class and the lower class, okay? These would be people like um, today, doctors and lawyers and, and those kinds of people. Um, although incomes varied, Goals, values, and lifestyle opportunities were similar among the middle class Europeans, even though there might be different levels of middle class. Now, the working class were the lowest class in this new social structure. The working class were where, where the majority of Europeans were considered, um, you know, the working class of society, and they included landholding peasants, the peasantry was now incorporated in this, the smaller farmers, uh, laborers like workers in the factories, and also domestic servants, meaning maids and butlers and those kinds of people that worked now for some of those upper bourgeoisie um, uh, in service to them. They also still worked for some of the nobility as well, but they were the ones that were in domestic service. Uh, there were improved working environments for this working class as we move deeper into the 19th century and approaching the 20th century. This was facilitated by um, more by buying power and better social conditions. Ultimately, as they were able to form unions and bargain collectively with the owners to give them better wages and better um, conditions and those kinds of things, they became more productive. And when the, they were more productive, the entire company was more productive. The factory owner made more money, so he felt more comfortable paying higher wages, and thus those people could then purchase more of the products that they could make. It was interesting because before, a lot of these folks could not afford the products that they were making, that they were working on, and now they could. Again, this is all a byproduct of the second Industrial Revolution, and in particular when um, the workers were allowed to unionize. Now, what about women? Um, attitudes towards women started to change as we move um, into the later half of the 19th century. Uh, they moved, many of them moved into white collar jobs like secretarial service. Uh, they received more education than they had been able to receive prior to that age. And they began campaigning as a result for the right to vote, like the men had. And so this is when we see the beginning of a real strong women's rights movement in Europe, in particular in England and in France. Uh, eventually we will see that spread to other areas of Europe. But of course, we also see the same thing happening in the United States at the same time. So during the second industrial revolution, women began to enter the labor force because of a lack of male workers. These positions were generally filled by lower class women. In the 1800s, marriage was the only career available to most women, although advances in economic conditions ultimately by the 1850s um, will change that. Now, advances in economic conditions will lead to a decline in birth rates also, so there will be less children that were available for work, but ultimately women will benefit in the long run from changes in attitudes towards them taking these kinds of positions. For women in the middle class families, um, activities centered on the family became more common by 1850. Now, when I say middle class in this, I really should say the elite class that we discussed on a previous slide. What I mean is the wives of those capitalists, those factory owners, the, uh, the the bourgeoisie women, if you will. They were the ones who now um, had to take care of the home, but they had money, they had enough wealth because of their husband's businesses to hire servants and to hire maids and those kinds of things. And so many of these women, because they had servants doing the household stuff, 
took up causes like women's rights and women's suffrage, meaning trying to gain women the right to vote, uh, to keep them occupied. And if any of you have seen Mary Poppins, of course, you now know I can always bring it back to Disney. Um, in Mary Poppins, the mom is constantly out of the house. Uh, she doesn't have to take care of the kids because she has a nanny for that. And she has servants to take care of the rest. So she's constantly out of the house working with other women's suffragettes, as they were called, to try to push for women's rights, women's voting rights in England. Um, and perhaps I'll show you a clip of this in class. Now, other women's experiences, besides raising their families, some lower class women, as we know, had to work to earn additional money for the family, working in factories, working in um, domestic, domestic servants, etc. Modern feminism began during the Enlightenment, as we know, with Mary Wollstonecraft that we mentioned before, Vindication of the Rights of Women. Remember, she was the mother of Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. But during the 19th century, women started to argue for the rights to divorce and to own property outright. In the medical field, women such as Amelie Sveting, Florence Nightingale, and Clara Barton transformed nursing into a professional occupation. So women, but instead of just being, quote, assistant to doctors in the medical field, they actually formed careers. The career of nursing really begins full-fledged by Florence Nightingale with her actions during the Crimean War. You see a quote by Florence Nightingale here, nursing is an art, and if it is made to be an art, it requires an exclusive devotion as hard a preparation as any painter's or sculptor's work. For what is the having to do with dead, with dead canvas or dead marble compared with having to do with the living body, the temple of God's spirit. It is one of the fine arts. I had almost said the finest of fine arts. What Florence Nightingale and Clara Barton did for um, nursing is they, they transformed it. Um, Florence Nightingale, who was an army nurse uh, during the uh, Crimean War, noticed that more men were dying of infection after the war than they died, you know, directly of wounds they received in the war on the battlefield. And so she determined that cleanliness really is next to godliness. And if nurses can help keep the wounds clean, keep the bedding clean, keep the bandages clean, uh, that the there was less likely for, for infection to set in and for death to result um, because of that. So this will transform the nursing profession. It becomes more of a professional um, occupation for women in the from the middle of the 1800s on. Now in the 1840s and 50s, as we just discussed before, women began to demand more and more political rights, and they believed that suffrage was key to improving their overall position in society. Now, remember the word suffrage just means given the right to vote. In 1903, one of the most infamous women suffragettes in England, Emmeline Pankhurst, founded the Women's Social and Political Union in Britain and used unusual publicity stunts to draw attention to her cause. She was often thrown into jail for her actions. She would chain herself to the, the gates in front of Buckingham Palace. She would chain herself to uh, the gates in front of the Parliament building. She would cause, um, you know, a, a closing of streets because of protests that she was founding. She would, um, you see her in this picture here being hauled off by the um, Municipal Police Force of London, they're known as the Bobbies. Um, and she did this to draw attention to the cause. Uh, others that followed in her footsteps would even go on hunger strikes. Um, they'd be thrown in jail and they were refused to eat. And if they um, um, died, uh, the authorities thought that would be a, a bad message to send. Um, and it would ultimately uh, blow up in their faces. So instead, the authorities started to try to force feed these women, which drew even more attention to the cause. Um, anyhow, 
that these causes will have a lot of influence. And like I said, even in Mary Poppins, we see the mom in Mary Poppins participating in the women's suffrage movement. Remember, these were mostly those bourgeoisie wives, okay, um, the uh, factory owners' wives who were participating in this because they were the ones that had time because they did not have to worry about going to work in the factory every day. Um, like many um, working class women did. Now, education and leisure as a result of industrialization, especially as we went through the second industrial revolution, uh, the levels of education began to rise. People's lives became more clearly divided into periods of work and leisure. There started to be such a thing as a weekend that people could spend away from work, resting, and even playing and doing other kinds of leisure activities. Between 1870 and 1914, Western nations began to also finance a system of primary education for children ages six to 12. This is government funding of primary education. This is the first time we've really seen this. And of course, this goes against traditional laissez-faire economics, the government is intervening in this. The government is regulating education. But at the same time, it was seen as necessary. If we are going to have a working public that can work these machines, they need to be able to do some rudimentary reading and writing um, and even um, figuring with numbers. And so this becomes uh, the government takes on this role for uh, primary education, um, of course, through the collection of taxes. Um, to help pay for it. Education was considered important for a viable labor force, as I said, and better educated voters as well. If the working class were eventually going to be giving the, given the vote, then they needed to be better educated to make better political decisions. Um, so that was another reason why. Uh, the immediate result of public education was a jump in literacy, of course, meaning more people learning how to read than ever before. And that will benefit all of society in the long run. Higher literacy rates led to the development of mass media as well. Newspapers were both now informative and entertaining. They didn't just have news in them, they had ads in them, they had comics in them. They had stories in them that were public interest stories, not just the straight news. And a literate population would eventually start to purchase millions and millions of copies of newspapers a day throughout all of Europe and the United States. Newspapers even became part of the Industrial Revolution as the printing presses would be mechanized through the use of steam engines to print them. New types of leisure, as I said before, were also available to Europeans and Americans as machines become more complex and more work can be done by machines um, and more time off was um, available to workers as they negotiated for better working hours with their bosses um, as productivity increased. So new types of leisure were available, as I said. People started to go to places like amusement parks. Amusement parks would be built. That would be another business that a businessman could go into, recognizing that the people need somewhere to go on the weekends. If he builds an amusement park, then he can um, uh, attract them to his amusement park and he can make profit off of that. Um, and as we know, and as y'all know, I'm a big fan of a big old amusement park down in Orlando, Disney World. It works. People went to amusement parks. They went to dance halls. They went to or and also went to participate in organized team sports. Sometimes they didn't just participate in them. They just watched them. Professional ball games, baseball in America, of course, is part of this. Rugby and cricket and those kinds of things in England etc. Um, so leisure and sports. Some of you were asking about when they had the development of, you know, uh, sports becoming a, a real thing. And it is during this second industrial revolution that that happened. Leisure time was now clearly defined as separate from work. And the leisure time was at the ends of the week. The bookends of the week, if you will. Sunday at one end of the week, Saturday at the other end of the week. 
Leisure time was also more passive in nature and people paid to attend leisure activities. Even things like shows, um, opera, uh, you know, the, the, the penny opera for the, the lower working class people rather than the, um, you know, the traditional opera. Um, but even we start seeing the beginning of things like moving pictures, starting off with silent pictures, of course, silent movies, but eventually the movie industry as well will be born out of all of this, the desire for more leisure activities for the working class. Now, Western Europe and political democracies, where we're going next, the growing prosperity of, of all after 1850 during this second industrial revolution will contribute to the expansion of democracy in Western Europe. And again, like I said at the beginning of the lecture, what we mean by democracy is really giving more people the right to vote for uh, representatives in legislatures that are now being brought about in most countries throughout Europe countries abandon absolute monarchies in exchange for constitutional governments. In the late 1800s, political democracy, meaning giving folks the right to vote, was spreading. More and more people were given the right to vote uh, throughout Western Europe, and eventually most European nations by the end of the 1800s had universal male suffrage. These laws were passed, giving all men the right to vote. Again, Emmeline Pankhurst and others like her are still pushing for women to get the right to vote, but they will not really get the right to vote until after World War I. Um, political parties also started to form to try to get those new voters' votes as elections would be held. And the, something known as ministerial responsibility became the dominant political entity, okay, especially in England and other constitutional governments. Okay, now what ministerial responsibility means is where the cabinet minister, in the case of the British Parliament, it would be the head of parliament, the prime minister. Okay, but the cabinet minister bears the ultimate responsibility for the actions of their ministry or department. They're responsible to the voters first rather than to the monarch. And this is a real change in the way governing will happen throughout the Western world. Now we know that Great Britain has had evolutionary liberalism, which we discussed in an earlier unit, um, where um, members of both political parties, the li more liberal party or known as the Whig party and the more conservative party known as the Tory party, vied for, for political power. They were the ones running for office in the House of Commons and whichever party had the majority at any given time had ministerial responsibility. They dominated and they were able to push through their initiatives. Kind of like in our, um, in our Congress here in, in this country, you know, whichever political party has either control of the Senate or the House um, of Representatives, whichever party has the majority, they have a lot more influence to get things done that they want to get done. However, what we need to remember about evolutionary liberalism in the British government is this. Both of these parties recognized the need for reforms to take place. They just differed on how many reforms and how quickly, but they both did recognize the need for reforms. For example, just like we have here, the more liberal party, the Whig party, wanted to vote for more widespread social reforms as more and more of the lower classes were given the vote. They knew that in order to stay in the majority position in the parliament, that they needed the support of those workers that were now being given the vote. The things that the workers wanted were social reforms, such as unemployment benefits and the um, you know, forcing the business owners to recognize that they need to have um, pension plans put in place for them, etc. But that does not mean that the Tory party did not recognize the need for some reforms too. They did. As a matter of fact, the Tories even sponsored bills that gave more of the working class the vote, hoping to win over their votes. If we give these people the vote, perhaps they'll vote for our party. So because both parties were willing to 
um, make reforms, we know that England did not have as much revolutionary upheaval pushing for these kinds of reforms as other nations did in the midst of the 19th century. Now, what about other areas of, in Western Europe when it came to political democracy or bringing in more people into um, the uh, political arena through voting? In 1875, after the um, fall of Emperor Napoleon III, he had to abdicate his throne after he lost the Franco-Prussian War in 1871. Remember, the Franco-Prussian War was the last war um, that Prussia fought to gain all of Germany, to create the German Empire through that German unification movement. Um, so uh, a few years after that, French will try a republic once again. So this will be the third republic in France, and they will rewrite the Constitution once again. Okay, the new government um, was established with a president and a legislature that was made up of two houses. And you see how it's um, how it's outlined right here in this picture, an upper and lower house legislature elected by universal male suffrage. The president would be chosen by the legislature for a seven year term. And the third uh, republic was really seen as a compromise because universal male suffrage to elect the upper and lower house of the legislature but the legislature itself chooses the president instead of the people. That was seen as a compromise um, from what they had attempted to do in the second French Republic, as well as in the first French Republic. And ultimately, this third Republic will be a lot more successful and last a lot longer. It will last 65 years, which is long in France because France seems to change their government every, you know, um, once every decade or so, it seems. Now, what about in Italy? Well, Italy, as we know, had emerged by 1870 as a united national state with a constitutional monarchy based in classical liberalism because it united around the nucleus of um, the smaller uh, Italian city kingdom of Piedmont. But the disparity of wealth in Italy and the widespread government corruption in Italy led to a weak centralized political system. And so that will ultimately cause problems for Italy moving forward in their stability. Also, we see economic problems and military weakness continues as we approach the 20th century. This is one of the reasons why Italy, prior to World War I, decided to join the alliance with the central powers, which was Germany and Austria and Italy, um, and eventually Turkey will be added to that as well, instead of the allies. Now, this will change as the war goes on, but Italy was very concerned with their location in Europe, in the center of Europe, central southern part of Europe, and they were worried if they didn't have a powerful friend behind them, um, like Germany, if you will that ultimately they might be overrun, if you will, by the more strong Western powers of like England and France. So they hedged their bets and joined with the central powers. After only one year of fighting in World War I, however, Italy will switch sides and in 1915, they will join the allied powers. We'll discuss this more when we get to World War I, but just kind of keep in the back of your mind that Italy was in a weaker political position. They had a lot of government corruption. They had a lot of economic problems and military weaknesses. So they are not a strong, stable state, um, even though they had finally unified to create one nation state. They were still not a very strong state unified, like they hoped they would be. Now, what about in other parts of Europe? We see that um, in Central and Eastern Europe, the old order of doing things kind of seems to be still be in place, meaning the old conservative style government, classical conservative style governments. Although Germany, Austria, Hungary, and later Russia, those three are part of Central and Eastern Europe in the old order, many of them do institute elections and in the creation of parliaments or national legislatures. Real power still remained in the hands of the emperors and the elites in these nations. 
So for example, Germany first. In Germany, the government um, had been established by Otto von Bismarck. As we know, he was the architect of German unification. And once Germany was unified, he continued to be the right-hand man of Kaiser William I, who was the German emperor. And he set up a two-house legislature that ultimately he controlled. Although the Reichstag, as it was called, the German legislature, was elected by universal male suffrage, okay, um, the emperor still maintained political power by controlling the military and the foreign policy. So the legislature did not have any power to control the military or to control foreign policy. And because the economy was geared so much towards the military as it had been when it was just Prussia still, that means that the legislature did not really have the power of the purse either. So this is why the emperor still had a lot more of traditional classical conservative authority, um, even though they, there was a legislature technically. By the reign of, after William I, by the reign of his son, William II, from 1888 to 1918, Germany had the strongest military in all of Europe, and they were the biggest industrial powerhouse in all of Europe. They had eclipsed England or Great Britain as the biggest industrial center in Europe. And the conservative forces with William II in charge thwarted the rise of democracy in Germany, allowing for more people to actively participate in government. So even though male voters would elect the Reichstag, the Reichstag did not have as much influence as a people's representative body as it would in other Western countries. So that's the, that's what we mean by democracy but not blooming as much in Germany. In the Austro-Hungarian Empire, as it's now known, the emperor, Francis or Franz Joseph, largely ignored the Austrian parliament and governed by imperial decree, just completely ignoring what the Austrian parliament was trying to advocate that he do. And ultimately, he had control over the armies and he had control over the economy. So again, like we kind of saw in Germany, the, the legislature in Austria was kind of weak as well, was not able to keep the, um, the king from doing what he wanted. Um, ethnic problems also threatened the stability of Austria. There's a lot of anti-Semitism going on in Austria at this time, meaning anti-Jewish um, um, problems going on, um, the, the attacks on Jews throughout society, etc. And this will threaten the stability of um, Austria as well. There's also ethnic problems with the fact that, as we know, Austria is still a polyglot empire, a multi-ethnic, multinational empire. And there are still areas of the Austrian empire that are pushing for their own nation. Okay, nationalism is still an issue. In Hungary, remember they had a dual monarchy in Austro-Hungarian Empire. We talked about that in the last unit. Uh, in the Hungarian section of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the parliamentary system worked a little better, worked more like the parliament did in England, although it was dominated by the nation's landholding class because they did not have universal male suffrage. Now, what about in Russia? Russia is where we really see problems. Nicholas II became the Tsar of Russia in 1894. He will be the last Tsar in Russia, as he will be the one that falls in the midst of World War I when the Russian Revolution takes place. But before that, he was, of course, the Tsar, and he was committed to autocratic rule in this large nation. Like his father before him, Alexander III, um, he believed that he needed to rule with an iron fist. Um, he remembered the, the memory of his grandfather, um, Alexander II, who had tried to advocate for reform, ultimately dying at the hands of anarchists. So he did not want to enact reforms because like his father, he saw that as um, you know, getting his grandfather killed. So Russia had started the industrialization process but it was halted 
with the death of Alexander II, who had started trying to do that. As I said before, when he was assassinated, that kind of came to a halt by Alexander III. It's still at a halt by the time Nicholas II becomes the Tsar. Some were now demanding more reforms and political power. Um, by 1905, there was actually a demonstration just trying to push for more um, of a say in government, maybe the creation of a national legislature. This took place in St. Petersburg, which was, of course, the um, capital city of um, the Russian Empire. And the Russian um, armies were told by the Tsar to disperse the crowd. Well, they took that to mean that they should shoot at people in the crowd. And it uh, ended up with hundreds dying. This was a bad um, look for the Tsar. It looked as if he's, of course, attacking his own people because he kind of did. And it ultimately will hurt his image with the public. Tsar Nicholas II, after his image was hurt by what happened in St. Petersburg, ultimately there were many who started to push for him to make some real reforms in the government and let go of some of that absolute power that he had. So he ended up having to relent and permit the establishment of a national legislature called the Duma. Now, this was also in part to the fact that simultaneously with this St. Petersburg massacre happening, um, Russia ended up going to war with Japan over territories in Asia. And within a couple of years, by 1907, Japan had soundly defeated Russia. Now, Japan is a very small nation compared to the large expanse of Russia, and that was seen as a very embarrassing thing that big Russia couldn't, couldn't beat little Japan. Um, and so this is another reason why he lost face, he lost some of his prestige, and those people in Russian society who were pushing for more of a say in government, well, he had to relent a little bit and create a national legislature called the Duma. Although he had limited the power of the legislative body by 1907, it will be very short-lived as the war, meaning World War I, approached, as we will see. But ultimately, starting in 1905, we see the beginning of the end of the Romanov dynasty, and the beginning of the end of Russia being ruled by a czar, leaving way for the communist Russian revolution to take place under the leadership of Lenin and the Bolsheviks, which we'll talk more about in a later lecture. Now, what's going on in the United States at the same time? The United States also had a second industrial revolution, and it produced wealth that was more concentrated than it was in Europe. In the United States, the Civil War had destroyed the Southern way of life, and new amendments to the U.S. Constitution protected civil liberties of African Americans. Between 1860 and 1914, the United States switched from a farm-based economy, as it had been, to an industrial economy. But still, the majority of the industrial, um, of the industrial uh, factories were in the northern part of the United States. The populations of urban centers soared, however, and by 1900, there were three American cities that had over a million inhabitants, and that was saying something. Um, America was booming at this time, and we had a lot of um, a lot of that was contributed to by the massive amounts of immigrants flocking to the United States from Europe by the end of the 19th century. Around the turn of the century, around 1900, America became imperialistic and acquired started to acquire territories abroad. We used manifest destiny to gain the idea that we had the right to take territories. Now, we had already taken all of this part of North America that we saw as ours, and now we were starting to influence other parts of the world, gaining access to raw materials, gaining naval bases, and those kinds of things. And so we became a major mover and shaker on the world stage as a result of that. European nations were doing the same thing at the same time, and we'll discuss this in a later um, unit, this imperialism, new imperialism unit. American forces 
um, ultimately will move into Hawaii and depose Queen Louis Kalani um, and, uh, in Hawaii and acquire that as a territory. Um, we also will acquire territories from the vanquished Spanish that we defeated in the Spanish-American War, taking Guam and Cuba, um, as well as uh, the Philippines. Now, international rivalries have to be discussed when we talk about this as well. Um, this is going to be the cre precursor leading up to World War I. Um, the German Emperor, William II, pursued aggressive foreign policies that ultimately divided Europe into two hostile alliance systems. Like I said, we'll talk more specifically about this in a later unit, but it is important to note that this alliance system that helps lead the world into World War I is actually starting to be created in the late 1800s. Okay, so this is how it begins. To prevent France from limiting its power, Germany entered into a defensive alliance with Austria-Hungary and Italy by 1882. This coalition would be known as the Triple Alliance and will eventually be known as the Central Powers during the war. Now, just so you know, they will also add another nation for a while. It will be the Ottoman Empire. So it will be the Quadruple Alliance eventually, um, and, but then Italy drops out of it by the first year of the war and the end of the first year of the war, and um, they join the Allied powers. So it's back to being three. Okay, there's one. In 1890, Emperor William II, of Germany actually fired Bismarck. Now remember, Bismarck had made sure that, that Germany was unified, had made sure that William II's father, William I, had all this absolute power as the emperor of this really strong Germany. But when William II came to the throne, just two years after taking the throne, he was a little bit of a punk and he thought that he didn't need Bismarck's help, okay? So he fired the smartest guy in the room, in other words, and said, no, thank you very much. I'll take it from here and do it on my own. Um, ultimately, he took control over Germany's foreign policy, which something that his father had left Bismarck, who was a much better diplomat, okay, than William II was. And ultimately, William II will act very aggressively. Uh, Germany acts very aggressively to try to take territories throughout the world during the imperialism phase that we'll discuss in a later unit. But by in 1894, William II ended the treaty Germany had with Russia. Now, Germany had had a treaty with Russia, and that was ended because William II did not see it as benefiting Germany and ultimately broke ties with Russia. Now, this will prove dumb in the long run because eventually Russia is going to enter the other alliance on the other side of what will be World War I. So now we have seen in two separate units um, a division between Russia and Austria, first of all, um, in the middle of the uh, 1800s because Austria did not come to the aid of Russia in the Korean War. And now we see Germany and, and Russia um, um, ending their treaty. Okay, so the two sides are starting to form. Now, how in the world does, you know, the other side form? Well, by 1907, France, Great Britain, and Russia had actually formed the alliance known as the Triple Entente. Now, the way this happened was very, very strange because, as we know, Great Britain and France have hated each other for centuries. They have been fighting wars against each other for centuries. They are always rivals and they have always hated each other. It is so improbable that they would ever form an alliance that is almost laughable. But this shows you how aggressive William II, Emperor of Germany, was. He was acting so aggressively, challenging both British dominance in North Africa and French dominance in North Africa, and he was acting like a big old bully, saying, I'm going to take this territory, and what are you going to do about it? Great Britain and France, who hated each other, 
actually were both of them more concerned with German aggression than they were with each other. So they formed a begrudging alliance with each other just because they had an enemy in common. They were more worried about an aggressive Germany than they were about each other. Now that's saying something about William II and his being a punk, if you will, and being an aggressive punk. Um, Russia, of course, um, since they had been abandoned by Austria and abandoned by Germany, now they had no friends. And we know that they were suffering after fighting a war with Japan and losing, and Russia was in a very precarious position, not being fully industrialized either. And so Great Britain and France um, recognized that if someday war did happen with Germany, their common enemy, and Germany is connected to Austria, Hungary, and Italy, that it might be good if they had an ally that was on the other side of those central powers of those in the Triple Alliance. The Triple Alliance powers are all in the central part of Europe. Russia was to the east of those territories. So it would make sense that if a war happened, if Great Britain and France were on the western border of, of Germany, Austria, and Italy, and Russia was on the eastern border, that would force the Triple Alliance to have to fight a two-front war rather than a one-front war. Okay, so even before the war happened, by 1907, the two sides were in place, the two opposing alliances of the Triple Alliance and the Triple Entente had become more divided and less willing to compromise at the beginning of the 20th century. This is a setup for World War I. What about other international rivalry, rivalries? Well, there was a crisis going on in the Balkans region. We've brought this area, this area up before and we'll continue to talk about it as we lead towards World War I. Okay, uh, the area that you see on the map in color there is the area known as the Balkans, includes Greece and Bulgaria and Serbia and Albania and Montenegro and all of those territories. Okay, we know that Russia had already tried to take some of these territories at the Crimean Peninsula up there in the Black Sea, um, and that was an issue. Um, as the Ottoman Empire began to lose more and more power, the provinces of Greece and Serbia and Romania and Montenegro in the Balkans began to gain their freedom from the Austrian Empire. One by one by one, nationalism set into those places, and they all were able to gain their freedom from the Ottoman Empire, okay, that had once controlled them. Austria and Russia now vied for more influence in that region. Once again, Russia will move in and try to take some territory, and they will actually get control of the Crimean Peninsula since the Ottoman Empire had weakened so much. So what they had tried to do 50 years before, they'll finally be able to do. Also, we see in 1908, Austria-Hungary annexed the Slavic territories of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and this outraged Serbia. Serbia was a free nation that wanted Bosnia for itself, wanted to establish a Slavic um, Serbian kingdom, and they felt that the Austrians had outmaneuvered them and they thought that that territory should be part of a greater Serbia rather than annexed into the multinational Austria-Hungary. Serbia and it became an ally with Russia because they both had interests in the Balkans region that were counter to Austria's interests. Russia also was a Slavic nation as Serbia was Slavic so they had a common national trait as well, and they were both the same religion, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. So Serbia uh, became allies with Russia, and as we know, Russia is already allies with Great Britain and France. You're kind of starting to see how the dominoes are being set up that are going to bring about the beginning of World War I, aren't you? Um, again, we'll discuss this in more detail when we get to the later unit but I want you to see how the stage is being set for this, this early on. So Serbia and its ally Russia began to prepare for war against Austria-Hungary. Germany 
which was the ally of Austria, demanded that Russia accept the Austrian annexation of this territory or face war. Russia, weakened by war with Japan, backed down at that time. But this was 1908, not 1914 yet. When 1914 rolls around, that will change. By the beginning of 1914, the crisis in the Balkans threatened the security of Europe and World War I was looming. Now let's talk a little bit more um, uh, the cultural stuff associated with the late 19th century, early 20th century. After, you know, we discussed romanticism and realism towards um, the beginning of this lecture. Now we're going to talk about different, more innovations happening. Dramatic innovation occurred in literature, the visual arts, and music in the late 1800s, beyond what we had seen in romanticism or realism. Now, between 1870 and 1914, many writers and artists produce works known as modernism, yet another ism for you. The naturalist writers addressed social problems such as alcoholism, women in society, and urban slums. Symbolist writers produced works that functioned for its own sake and did not attempt to criticize or understand society. These are both part of the modernism movement although they are different. So modernism is more of an umbrella term that covers a bunch of different genres and different things that are going on at this particular time. And some of it is kind of random and hodgepodge. And so that's why oftentimes modernism is seen as this kind of um, alienated, feeling um, of loss and um, not really understanding where we fit in this society or in this world kind of feeling in those parts. In France, artists such as Claude Monet embraced a new painting style known as Impressionism. Impressionists rejected indoor studios and instead went out into nature to paint, where they captured the interplay of light, the sky, and water with color. And the again, the, the, the viewer was part of the artistic process because the viewer's eye would blend colors. The, the artist would put, you know, um, two colors next to each other without fully blending them on the painting. And the, the viewer steps back from the painting and sees those two colors blended together like a yellow and a blue. Blend, your eye blends in as green. This is why Impressionist art looks kind of fuzzy, close up, but when you step back from it, the picture becomes clearer. So the, the viewer is actually part of the artistic process. Then you have the next movement um, after Impressionism. Remember, this is also part of Modernism. Okay, but after Impressionism, you have um, Post-Impressionism. Vincent van Gogh and Paul Cezanne um, are probably the most famous uh, post-impressionists. They used color and structure to express mood in a form known as post-impressionism. These artists wanted to represent reality, but not mirror it, as did the camera. They wanted to show um, the, um, you know, reality with structure and mood rather than with mirror images of things. Um, okay. Uh, the Spaniard Pablo Picasso was another one um, uh, who painted in a new style using geometric designs to recreate reality. So he's trying to not mimic reality, not mirror reality, not um, represent reality, but to recreate it in um, his own way using geometric designs and color. This modern style of art is called cubism. Modernism influenced architecture as well, and skilled builders um, will uh, continue to innovate when it comes to uh, how buildings will be built. Some of the most dominant ones were Louis H. Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright of the United States, who created buildings that were clean lined and functional. Um, in actuality, right here in Florida, we have a whole area of Frank Lloyd Wright buildings. 
um, the campus of Florida Southern University down in Lakeland, Florida is all built by Frank Lloyd Wright. All the buildings are built by Frank Lloyd Wright. If you're ever interested in going and visiting a college and seeing some really cool looking buildings. Now in music, the quote, modern sounds of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring caused a near riot in Paris when this ballet was, was performed the first time. Um, they were upset by the new sounds and rhythms of the performance. Um, the story of the ballet, um, you know, was part of it. After various primitive rituals celebrating the advent of spring, a young girl is chosen as a sacrificial victim and dances herself to death. But the way that Stravinsky scored the ballet, it had lots of um, atonal sounds in it and did not, it was not pushed by a melody that was like a hook that people could, you know, could uh, leave humming. You know, it was not like, you know, you heard with the romantic period that was driven by melody. Instead, this was disturbing and um, caused the rhythms and the sounds were so odd um, to the ear and as well as what was being performed on stage that people nearly rioted in the streets after this happened. They hated it so much. What's interesting is this Rite of Spring has become really, really, you know, popular as a, you know, example of this time period of the culture of modernity. Um, in um, 1987, a recreation of the original 1913 choreography from the opening scene can be seen by clicking on that link, Rite of Spring. Um, but you may be familiar with some of the music from it if you've ever seen the original Fantasia from Disney. Again, I can always bring it back to Disney. Um, the scene where the dinosaurs are actually, you know, fighting each other and then dying because, you know, the... Um, um, global warming and <laughs> the ice age or whatever is happening um, is they use the music from the Rite of Spring. Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. So maybe we could check it out sometime in class, at least that one section of it. Uncertainty will continue to grow. Scientific discoveries in this period had, prof had a profound impact on how people saw themselves and their world. And they kind of take these new ideas, especially in, um, in chemistry and in physics in particular, will kind of set the idea of natural laws that we talked about since the scientific revolution, kind of set them up on their head a little bit. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, people like Marie Curie, or Madame Curie, as she was sometimes called, yes, a woman, how about that? challenged the accepted view that the universe existed independent of its observers. She did this with her discovery of the element, um, that the element radium gave off energy in and of itself. Her experiments with radium will eventually give way to radioactive materials that can be used for any number of things, powering things, but also to eventually be weaponized and used for warfare. Her experiments with radium ultimately led to her death. She died of cancer because radi radium causes cancer. It's radioactive. Um, they didn't know that at the time, but um, she did a lot of advancements that do advance science a great deal. Um, uh, probably even more influential will be the German-born scientist, physicist, Albert Einstein. Okay, Albert Einstein provided a new view of the universe with his theory of relativity, which stated basically that space and time are not absolute, but are relative to the observer. You see here a quote from him, reality is merely an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. Now, I don't expect to be able to explain all of the theory of relativity to you. But here it is in a nutshell, okay? Basically, he was not arguing that natural laws didn't exist, okay? He wasn't going completely against what Newton had said. There were natural laws that govern the universe. I mean, if we can understand what those natural laws are, we can figure out how, why the universe moves the way it does. But what he did say is that the natural laws that govern the universe are not constant to every place. They're not exactly the same 
but every part of the universe. In other words, they're relative to where, where they are in the universe. For example, using the natural law of gravity to explain this. The gravitational pull here on Earth is different than the gravitational pull like on the moon, okay? So somebody can weigh 100 pounds here on the Earth, but they weigh less than that on the moon because the gravitational pull is different, okay? So it's not really that they weigh differently, but the gravitational pull, which is translated into how much they seem to weigh in that system, is what's different. So the natural law of gravity still exists everywhere. It's just not consistent and exactly the same everywhere. Instead, it's relative. That's what we mean by the theory of relativity. And he also explained this, of course, in his famous equation, E equals mc squared, and G equals mass times acceleration squared. Now, probably one of the more influential and infamous um, uh, guys who comes out of this um, modern era is really with the advent of things like psychology. A doctor from Vienna named Sigmund Freud asserted that human behavior was actually strongly determined by past experiences that a human being experiences, but also by internal urges that they are born with. So we are not just byproducts of our past experiences, and we're not just byproducts of our internal urges that we're born with. We are instead a mixture of the two together. Freud determined this by using a method known as psychoanalysis, in which he had a patient probed deeply into, he and a patient probed deeply into the patient's memory for healing purposes using initially hypnotism. Through hypnotism, he could get the patient to tell him things that they don't, didn't remember telling him once they woke up, things that they didn't remember even happening to them perhaps um, uh, in an earlier period in their life. And so this unconscious mind was seen to be where the real person um, resided. And this is what he referred to as the id, the unconscious mind was where the biological urges, such as desire and aggression, our urges that we're born with, that are part of us that we can't really control with our conscious mind, they are part of our unconscious mind, and they seek out pleasure and avoid pain. Okay, the id, the unconscious mind, Freud would argue, is where our, quote, true self lies. But then there are two other parts of the human psyche besides the id. There is then the ego. The ego is where our reason resides, our ability to reason. And our reason tries to restrain the impulses of the id that would be unacceptable to other people or to society. Okay, our reason. But then there's another part of our um, psyche, the conscious mind, or the superego. Okay, the superego and the ego are actually both part of the conscious mind. Okay, the part that we recognize when we're awake or not in dreaming, not dreaming or not under hypnosis. But um, the ego is the reason and the super ego is what we call our moral center, our moral conscience. The values that are adopted from our family and from society and from our culture. These enable a person to tell right from wrong. Their conscience, like Jiminy Cricket, let your conscience be your guide, okay? Um, it's almost as if you've seen those cartoons before where, you know, a person has a little devil on one shoulder and a little angel on the other shoulder, and the angel and the devil are trying to tell the person what to do, okay? Well, um, the little devil on one side, that would be the id, okay, trying to say, hey, do this, do this, this is what you should do, this is what feels good, this is what you should do, this is what your urges say to do, whereas the angel is the super eager say, no, that's not morally right. You can't do that. And your ego, your reason is your head in between that has to listen to these two, okay? Ultimately, Freud said the ego and the super ego, since they are part of the conscious mind, they actually repress the id. They force it underground and they force it deep into our psyche 
into our unconscious mind um, and repress it. And therefore, we are always repressing our true selves is what he would argue. And we can only unlock our true selves through psychoanalysis to better get to know why we do the things we do. Anyhow, you can take that with a grain of salt, but that is a, the best way I have to explain it. All right. Now, extreme nationalism, as we will discuss, moving up in the next two units with imperialism and leading up to World War I. Uh, in the late 1800s, extreme nationalism was reflected in the movements of social Darwinism and anti-Semitism. In the 1800s, many Europeans became fiercely nationalistic and they used social Darwinism to justify the strength and wealth of nations to seize territory abroad. It was seen that if a nation has industrial capacity, has a military might, has the wealth and wherewithal to take a territory from another country, then they have the right to do so. Might is right, if you will. And those countries that were not fully industrialized, that were not fully modernized, that could not uh, defend themselves uh, technologically against them being taken over, well, then they deserve to be taken over. This is what social Darwinism was. This was not what Darwin originally said, but this is social Darwinism. And this was actually brought about by a social scientist named Spencer, who took the ideas of Darwinism and applied them to society, saying those societies that, that um, can, can control technology, meaning industrial technology, have the right um, to take over those that don't. Might makes right. And this will become problematic moving forward into the 20th century, as we will see in the next couple of units. We also see um, how this extreme nationalism can be dangerous um, because throughout Europe, as I briefly mentioned before talking about Austria, but we see it all throughout Europe, we have anti-Semitism on the rise. It had been around for centuries, but it became more intense during the late 1800s. So as to win voters, political groups started to blame Jews for many problems. The worst treatment of Jews occurred in Russia, where persecutions became part of national policy, especially under Tsar Nicholas II. Okay, these were called pogroms or pogroms, depending on who you ask, pogroms or pogroms, and they were basically attacking Jewish communities um, for absolutely no reason other than the fact that they were Jews. Now, Nicholas II was doing this because since he had lost some of his popularity among his people, he was blaming all the problems of Russian society on the Jews um, and letting them absorb the hatred. Anti-Semitism does not follow logic, folks. It is hatred against Jews. We've seen it before, waves of anti-Semitism throughout history, um, starting in the Roman Empire and then moving forward, actually starting even before the Roman Empire. We saw it at the beginning of this course when we talked about the, um, the bubonic plague, the Black Death. This is just another example of it. We even see it in Western nations during the same time period like France with the Dreyfus Affair. Okay, the Dreyfus Affair you'll read more about in your textbook, but ultimately the um, French military, uh, there were secrets being leaked to Germany and um, of the highest level that only highest ranking members of the French military would know, the French general staff. And so they ultimately accused the only French Jewish general that there was of leaking those secrets to Germany. His name was Edward Dreyfus, Alfred Dreyfus, sorry. And ultimately there was no evidence against him. He was sentenced to a penal colony um, for 12 years um, before he was finally, it was finally determined that he was not the, the guilty culprit. Um, but by then his career was ruined. He had uh, lost uh, many members of his family and his life was completely destroyed. Um, again, there was no evidence against him, but he was Jewish and therefore he was an easy target. Ultimately, these kinds of attacks against Jews, these anti-Semitic attacks against Jews, led to a group of people inspired by nationalism, of course, uh, to form a Jewish nationalist movement called Zionism. Zionism helped many Jews to emigrate 
away from Europe where they were being attacked to places like the United States, but ultimately they wanted to form a Jewish homeland once again in the original promised land to the Jews in Palestine. Now, the nation of Israel, okay, will not actually be created until after World War II, okay? And there are still troubles in this area to this day because those Palestinians that have been living there for several centuries by that point did not want to give it away. So there's still struggles over this area still to this very day. Um, but the father of Zionism, the founder of this Jewish nationalistic movement, so national, so uh, sorry, Zionism is Jewish nationalism, okay? Um, like I said, he was Theodore Herzl. He's the one who was the father or founder of Zionism. And he's often cited as the founder of the state of Israel, even though it will not be officially founded until 1947 after World War II. And it is established by the United Nations. More on that on a later lecture. Thanks.